crows. <laughs> Mara, daughter of the Nile, juggled two masters and faced 
down Pharaoh had ships. A female Pharaoh. It took me forever to find out anything else about her. Caddy Woodline rode through the dark to warn her Indian friends the whites were coming to kill them. Then, one Friday in seventh grade, my homeroom teacher handed me the fellowship of the ring. Fantasy was an arena where women could be warriors fighting in battle. Except, well, <laughs> Eowyn surrenders her sword at the end of the trilogy. C.L. Moore's Jirel of Joyring asks her men at arms why they cower in the corner like so many women. Robert Howard's pirate queen Balak dances naked for Conan and dies at the end of the story. For the rest, in fantasy, women were oversexed trophies or sword fodder there to die. Science fiction, which I found later, was much the same with a few notable, largely sexless exceptions like Robert Heinlein's Pee Wee and Isaac Asimov's Susan Calvin. Until I found less of Kern and Frank Herbert's women, science fiction women were playmates, background, or collateral damage. I continued to write what I wanted to read. Female warriors, girl warriors, who made sense. Who would not surrender what they had labored to become, even if they fell in love. Who were not dislikable. Who fought enemies who looked suspiciously like the people who made my life a misery as <laughs>
was everything I wanted. Alana has a temper. She is as outspoken as I was afraid to be for years growing up in my mother's house. She is too stubborn to know when to quit. She finds strength in her friendships, just as I have always done. Most important to me, after my years spent reading high fantasy, she lives a real life. In the wilderness, she gets cold, she bundles up. As Alana grows older, her body changes, which felt like ruin to a motherless girl who was masquerading as a boy. I used something to Alana that happened to me with one difference. I was overjoyed when I saw my chest bobble in the mirror, <laughs> because my mother then had to keep her promise and buy me a training bra. <laughs> Alana was furious at her body's betrayal of her real sex. She does recover eventually to live a sexual life. Unlike other young noblemen of her time, and like most and like most young women I knew in the 70s, Alana had that choice. She had cut herself off from the strictures of medieval marriage, just as Calidry would do. She made decisions about her sexuality, just as I did. Alana, having an open sex life, gets birth control. I never thought any of these choices were controversial, revolutionary, or unusual. They were part of my reality, Therefore, they became part of the Tortal universe and the Circle universe. During the years that I sent the first single manuscript to adult publishers, I had different jobs. One was that of house mother in a group home of teenage girls. When the director learned I had had a book the girls wanted to read, he asked about the material. I told him there was sex, violence, and drug and alcohol use. <laughs> He said that the girls couldn't read it since these things had gotten them into the home in the first place. <laughs> we worked out a deal. After the girls came home from school and at night before they went to bed, they demanded the story from me. They, I sat with the manuscript in my lap and retold it, edited, though not as much as the director. <laughs> the girls loved it. When I was finished with Alana's story, I wrote space adventures for them until I moved to New York. Small wonder that, when I showed my manuscript to literary agent Claire Smith a year later, she told me to break it up into four books for teenagers. I knew I could do it. In the rewrite, as at the group poem, I didn't change as much of the material as people sometimes think I should have done. It never occurred to me or to Claire, or to my editor, the great Jean Carl, or if it did, they never mentioned it. I drew a curtain over the explicit sex, but I had done that for my girls. I deleted the drug use and magic. It wasn't necessary, and I didn't want kids to think I advocated it. I tussled with Jean over the use of brandy as a restorative in Lioness Rampant. We came to a compromise that I feel worked even better. Liam Iron Arms Herbal Messes. And through my, throughout my rewrite, the one that became the quartet, I worked to make the books even more real. Both Alana and later Kel have to work for their combat skills. Having listened to the men's scorn, to men's scorn on the subject of women in combat for years, I wrote both girls' training very carefully. On the field, they worked to keep up honing their speed and endurance. 
slowly, against his own wills, his own will, he sees in her a fighter as indomitable as he is himself. Almost in spite of himself, he begins to help her to overcome her fear of heights that has been with her since she was a child. He lets her stay, and she continues to show him what she is made of, just as he understands that here is someone who is good at the things he can teach. He also understands that in teaching the other boys his own stony, merciless code, he has done them a grave disservice. To survive her time as page, squire, and knight, Kel has friends. Neil is one of my most popular characters, a sharp-tongued former medical student who cannot keep silent. <laughs> he tells us what we need to know about things Kel isn't aware of or will not examine. An idealist who turned to cynicism at the university, he has rediscovered his idealism at the hands of a girl five years his junior, a girl, moreover, whose response to romantic excess is to urge him to eat his vegetables. <laughs> As a contrast to Neil, Kel has Owen, the cheerful, outgoing younger brother who will blurt out your secrets and immediately leap into any fight in which you are taking part. Slowly, other boys from among the pages come to stand at her side, showing the bullies among the pages that they will no longer reign unopposed. Kel's friends also learn that if they listen to her in a crisis, she will keep them alive. Unlike Alana, Kel has female friends. The closest is her mate. At first, Lalasa is terrified of her young mistress until she must explain Kel's first physical changes to her. That early bond is strengthened when Kel, finding Lalasa has been abused, teaches her how to defend herself. Lalasa is also gobsmacked to find that Kel does not blame her for the abuse, but her abuser, a paradigm shift in Lalasa's world. No longer mistress and maid when they are alone together, they know they can trust one. For birth control, Kel gets the talk from her mother. Claire Smith had urged me to write a good mother someday, and after knowing a couple, including Claire, I was able to do it. Elaine was also a warrior in the Imani Islands, another woman whose history gives Kel strength. My family has always had cats, birds, and dogs when I was young. Working on the day books, I got to know the available New York City wildlife I had by feeding animals in the parks and streets. <laughs> Alana had her horse Moonlight and her purple-eyed black cat Faithful, a gift from the book goddess, based on my college cat Fido, who <laughs> did not have purple eyes. <laughs> in Cal's case, the pages are now forbidden pets, but there is forbidden <coughs> And there is forbidden. Due to Dane's power spreading wherever she is, animals are aware of humans and their motives. When tender-hearted Kel feeds the courtyard sparrows, they decide to move in. Based on some of the birds I knew in Riverside Park, they become Kel's scouts and alarm system. Jump is the dog I always wanted, a bull terrier who won't obey orders he doesn't agree with. <laughs> he is very good at taming crusty training masters. Then there is the gelding Peach Blossom, a monster of a horse who hates everyone until Dane brokers a deal for him with Cal. Now Peach Blossom is Cal's horse as long as she does not use the spur. Cal's human friends know to keep out of range of his teeth. In Squire, Kel also illustrates my encounters with caring for injured wild animals and feral cats when she looks after a baby griffin based on my best friend's dove. <laughs> Anyone who thinks doves are birds of peace have never known any personally. <laughs> like me, Kel 
killer, the child killer, based on a historical <coughs> murderer of children. It was a relief for us both, and it wasn't. That scar in the earth would never fade for either of us. Back in their former camp, and where the World Trade Center used to be. I continue to talk to military women and read their stories during Kel's Quartet and after, incorporating what I learned. I don't want young women to think entering the military will be easy. And I have received letters, most notably from one woman who commanded a ship from the Navy and another from a woman who served first as patrolman, then detective, then on the bomb squad, right here in Chicago. Both of them told me I got everything right. Other writers have told me that Kel has helped them to deal with their parents by showing them how to control their temper. Recently, I got a letter from a fourth grader who said that thinking of what Kel did to overcome her fear of heights helps her to face her own fear of the dark. I have heard too many times to count that LGBT fans took from a brief exchange between Kel, Neil, and their bullies that I thought it was okay to be LGBTQ. They tell me this leaning close in tears, leaving me in tears. I have promised them that I would do better than one ellip elliptical exchange, and I have. I have cooler fans than anybody. <laughs> Change. But the girl is 